Now? Okay, this is Jim Cohn. It's the 7th of July, mm -hmm. 2007. My name is spelled C-O-H-N. Do I get an A? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Hey, today's the day for the um, big concerts, too. Which concerts? The outdoor, you know, concerts oh. around the world. Oh, live world, a, world, yeah. live world? Yeah. Oh. I don't think there's anybody playing in there that I'd want to see. <laughs> <Big> <laughs> anyway, um, so let's start out by, um, I need you to start way back in Utah to talk about Europa, because that's where you met Allen Ginsberg, right? Was he one of your teachers there? Did he teach there? Right. Allen Ginsberg founded the Naropa Institute with Ann Waldman. What year was that? Um, the Jack Kerouac School of Disembodied Poetics was founded in... 80, no, 74, 1974, in Boulder, Colorado. Allen was a disciple or a, a student of Trungpa Rinpoche, and uh, he and Ann Waldman founded the Rope Institute's Kerouac School of Poetics at, at that time. And um, I took my first class from Ann Waldman in 1976 as a senior, while while being a senior as an English major at the University of Colorado at Boulder. I took a class of hers that spring semester called Poetics. Did you already consider yourself a poet at this time, or were you writing poetry, or were you just sort of starting getting Kind of not, okay. really, much. And um, I was at Naropa off and on between 76 and 1980, and uh, I was working for Burlington Northern in 1979 and living in, in Missoula, Montana, and I had written Allen Ginsberg uh, a letter to apply to be a teaching assistant for um, that season, and I heard back, and um, I was a, his t TA then in the summer of 1980, and I was... Uh, completed a certificate of poetics program there that year as well. So I worked closely with Alan in the summer of 1980. And the project I worked on with him at the time was a Younger Poets collection for City Lights books for Lawrence Farrell and Getty in San Francisco. There were three younger poets that Alan Ginsberg championed they were Antler, who lives in Milwaukee, who had published a great long work called Factory. There was the poet Andy Clausen, who uh, was an ex-Marine um, immigrant to the United States, whose uh, poetry was thought to carry on the, the lineage of Neil Cassidy, who was a friend of Jack Kerouac and Allen Ginsberg's. And, the beat poets. <coughs> and there was a third poet named David Cope from Michigan who had sent Alan poems and Alan was enamored with his poetry. He found it in the tradition of the objectivist poets going back to William Carlos Williams and uh, Charles Reznikoff, the Chicago lawyer poet. So I was working with David Cope uh, and corresponding between him and Alan in 80. And in during that summer, I went to a doctor's visit uh, with Alan, who had um, had a, a partial stroke due to some bad medication he had taken. And he was, um, at that point, in his 60s, uh, early 60s, I think. and. We were sitting in a doctor's office, and uh, in the waiting room, he started talking to me about golden ages of poetry. And he had mentioned that Ezra Pound, uh, who he had known and championed during the time that Ezra Pound was charged with treason and placed in St. Elizabeth's Hospital in DC uh, from the time of his internment around 1946 to um, his release in the 50s after 11 years, 
um, Pound had been thought to be treasonous to the United States government for making anti-American and anti-presidential attacks from Italy and these radio um, gigs he was doing, like iPod kind of radio shows he was doing out of Italy during the war. And uh, Allen said he had learned from Pound that golden ages of poetry were always happening when traditional, academic, formal, official language, um, dominant language states were uh, hit with vernacular street language um, of the people. And that when that language busted through, sort of the official English, the this is how we're going to think about life, this is a, you know, heavy iron conceptualized reality, um, accountability language, you know, integrity language, you know, sort of credo language of that like we're all going to be good citizens and good patriot. When that language is busted out by sort of what people are really thinking about their government or what they're really thinking about their life or what they're thinking about sex or what they're thinking about politics. Th how that, the poetry, that led to poetry that was really a more timeless and kind of eternal and for the generations to come kinds of work. And so this happened in a doctor's office, like uh, five minutes. And this was very powerful for me. And he didn't just read it out of the Reader's Digest. Oh, no. There. No, we're talking <laughs> about, um, <clears throat> we're talking Dante. And Alan had a, just an absolutely, uh, you know, audio and visual graphic memory. So for, for poetry, he probably the last great living poet of our in America who, who had that kind of prodigious knowledge of poetry and poetic culture and poetic history. Did he think that that, that happened, that his golden ages happened because of um, linguistic shifts or a critical mass of people using the more colloquial thing so that it butted up against it because of demographics or because it was a political thing? Or like why, why would it happen that something would challenge? Was it a political thing that was the exception of the challenge to the hegemony, or was it the, the linguistic conflagration? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I think he generally looked at it as a combination of cultural, political, spiritual evolutions. Um, you know, I don't think he would isolate it into just it was the language, or it was just the politics, or it was just mm -hmm. a certain but it was a coming together sort of a, of a perfect storm of art. Mm -hmm. sort of that, so that art expression through poetry in particular, which was uh, the genre in question, was um, through language itself, was in fact through the subjective, through people claiming as they would like right now was because we live in this world of really self-production, self -production, a loss of, ob of sort of omniscient, omnipresent, objective news. Uh, when those kinds of controls are uh, loosened or else pried off by, you know, people, by particularly artists, then it's a combination of social, you know, political, um, the academic, the the governmental is just it that gets pride off people's backs. They just see things different way. They just see sort of wars as completely the war that they're in that's being fought for a certain kind of reason. They just don't s agree with the with the government, and so yeah, I think it's a combination. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he said this all to you. Well, he basically just talked about Pound and the golden ages of poetry. And so I took him home um, to his apartment where he lived with the poet Peter Olowski and um, while he was teaching that summer at Naropa. Um, and I was walking down the street in Boulder 
and I just had one of those light bulb moments where for some reason I thought about sign language and um, that in terms of huh I think I have to learn about sign language I think sign language might be a confluence point where what deaf people might be thinking and creating might have a similar kind of experience, at least for American letters, if not for uh, American culture in general. If that, if what the language of that, that unofficial in the sense of disability or in the sense of s stereotypes, if that is known to a greater number of people, that that might flood out something that is so misconceived, sort of so heavily conceptual and not based in any kind of truth of what's happening. So that's when I s sort of meandered back and forth to try to begin to learn sign language, to try to begin to meet oh, this world and enter, enter into it. You had never met a deaf person before, seen sign before, or anything like that? Not really, not really. <coughs> Did you right away start? Except maybe a deaf piano tuner I, I knew one time. Yeah. He always, the lower range was always off. <laughs> 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 Never got those lines. Did, um, you have to be quiet. Okay, quiet. Sorry. I'll cough one more time, okay? Did, so you had this idea, and did you immediately try to find a sign class like that You know, <clears throat> my, my learning in sign language essentially evolved like AA meetings or something. I would be in towns, and I would like see there would be a sign language class. And actually, at that time, there were sign language classes everywhere as soon as you just looked you would go I was traveling a lot and so I was living in my truck in Arcata California at that point and I took a class out there after after that that was my first foray at a community college I think um, up near Eureka and then I was at SUNY New Paltz I was really traveling cross country a lot at that point I was hitchhiking around and I working odd jobs and um, so yeah I slowly ended up here at NTID where we are now at the National Technical Institute for the Deaf in 82 after hitchhiking back to New York State from uh, upstate New York when my sign language class completed my first one which was a, maybe a month or two and at that time, I got picked up by a guy who was a student here at RIT who had told me, wow, there's a lot of deaf people hanging out around this place where I study. Do you want to come see the, the campus? And uh, so, yeah, I was here for maybe a half hour, and I checked into an interpreter training program here and was interested in that as a way to kind of do both the things I, I wanted to do, which was learn sign language for my own sort of personal growth and interest and admiration and actually meet the po potentially the poets of my generation who were deaf. Did you, um, <clears throat> when you started taking sign, um, I know when I started taking sign, the tactile kinesthetics that you're like just this immediate hit, like this is what my hands were supposed to be doing. You know, I really felt this immediate thing that I wanted to do this more. Did you, did anything resonate for you when you started learning sign that was helping you along the path to find the answer you were looking for in terms of the poetics and just were learning, but did you already see possibilities in the visual aspects of it or any, anything about it hit you that was leading you more towards that kernel that had come to you in the beginning of your thought process? I don't know if I had like great thought processes or much of thought processes about about that, but we had read 
uh, I had read as a student um, Chinese as a medium, the Chinese written word as a medium for, po for poetry, something like this is the title of a book by Ernest Fenollosa and Ezra Pound, a little book um, that really interested me about the representational aspect of the Chinese written word as a medium for poetic expression, sort of the representational aspect where a word visualizes somehow or represents somehow what it is about. So, so I don't think it was necessarily a mind-hand connection or sort of the, you know, painting on, mm -hmm. painting pictures on heaven, um, kind of quality of sign language that draws a lot of people to it. But I guess I was interested in the sheer, um, the sheer visual quality of the sign as a, as to be representational of things as they are, or time as it is being described in the moment, or recreating past, or so that sign language was like this machine for a for making poems was really fascinating for me. It was very representational, and it began to make me see our own spoken or written English language as so abstract, so um, in our heads, and so potentially filled with neurosis or hallucinatory experience that was not, rep you know, tied to things themselves, things as they are, that was actually a grounding and sane, both contemplative and sort of meditative practice. So actually signing was really a practice of meditating on the world as it is, as it appears. But doesn't that mean that you're saying that sign doesn't have the same capability of being abstract, and that it's incredibly concrete, and I mean, in, in a sense that's maybe that, that makes it seem that it doesn't have the sophistication of being abstract, or that it, you know what I mean? Like, are you <coughs> imbuing it with qualities that were comforting to you, but aren't necessarily true? I'm wondering. Right. Not really. I mean, I those are that's sort of that. When people study deaf culture or ASL culture, they tend to put these, you know, set up these oppositional camps of the, you know. I think William Stokey did a great job of, particularly as a hearing person, and that was an influence of, for me as well, like from the linguistic community to sort of up the ante on ASL for people to admit that people had to admit that this language, that this was a language. I just, um, and, and obviously for me, ASL is as much a language on par with any other language. And one of the definitions of a language, particularly in arguments around ASL, is it's, does it or didn't it have an abstract quality? Were deaf people really capable? Were they really thinking in the same way? Was their cognition of the same set as the rest of the peoples and their languages of the world? So I, I'm not sort of saying that it's, I, I think it was that representational argument that, um, this, that sort of connotes that this was a people that was incapable of abstract thinking and their language wasn't capable of any kind of um, angelic or um, philosophical or mathematical capabilities equal to you know, the Egyptians or uh, you know, the great civilizations of, of the world. But what's interesting is there's a huge, there is the history of this dragging oppositional nature of these arguments, and uh, that was no problem for me at all. I just thought, as a poet, uh, that the visual quality w is, is premier because the lineage I come from was language actually has three sort of functions 
the premiere being, as Pam would say, the phantom poetic function being the visual, that that is the most translatable, that people can understand that uh, regardless of what culture they're from, what language they speak. And as a poet, I wanted to ultimately be part of a tradition that would speak sort of cross-generationally or uh, intragenerationally on a global level. So sign language for me, with the emphasis on the language being a given, um, and the secondary aspect was the sign was the visual, was the phanopoeic, so it would be the most cross-cultural, like regardless of time and space. The other aspects of Pound's sense of language was wit and melody. And I think people tend to sort of not see the rhythmic elements of ASL. Uh, they they kind of get fascinated, particularly novices, particularly myself as a novice. I was fascinated with the visual and not necessarily understanding the the melopoeic, the the musicality or the rhythmic elements of sign. But I think that that came later, and I was probably unconsciously, a, as a beginner, um, maybe even more influenced by that as a hearing person than I was the visual, and. So I think, but as a, as a question of like, was it one or the other, or did I think ASL wasn't a language at first, or was I involved in a struggle to uplift it with other people, that, that was already done. Mm -hmm. To me, that wasn't even an issue worth discussing. I was just interested as a poet in the vision, sort of the wit and the music, and I, over time, began to see all those elements as a part of it, the more I could look in and understand what was being communicated and produced. So that's <clears throat> when you're told, that's when you're having conversations with people, but what was happening here? Like when you were here and you decided to get an interpreter training program, and I'm assuming that was just as a fast track to learn it as fast as you could. Did you ever have any, any aspirations to become an interpreter? Yeah, yeah. I pr I needed a job. I mean, I had a degree in English, so you know the question they ask English, you know, graduates always ask is, "Do you want that with fries?" <laughs> you know, so uh, yeah. So I had become a piano tuner after I graduated from the University of Colorado in Boulder, and it with it as an English major, because I was trying to find a way to make it in the world as an artist. And then I went from being an, my own personal kind of back and forth vision was somehow, on the one hand, I'd become a piano tuner and technician. And on the other hand, I was diving into becoming a sign language interpreter, both vocationally. And they, that was kind of confusing at the time. but. I don't think that w it was not a fast track for me. It was just, uh, um, but it turned out to be an, a major an sort of like anthropological kind of journey, which I think anybody could frame their experience around. I think our studies here at NTID were um, sensitive enough to sort of permit the ethnographic or just sort of the informant process to emerge as a real way to actually learn language. You had to meet people. You had to be a social agent to, to, to deal with learning this language. And you, because there were customs and attitudes and ways of life that you couldn't just learn uh, devoid of the people in incorporating the language. So that wasn't particularly, f that was f sort of fast track being here at this mecca of deafness. Mm -hmm. So we would go to those deaf parties and, um, you know, we would smoke a lot of dope and everybody was high and people were listening to music, you know, full blast so that you're, uh, you're 
bones were, were felt like you were, they were going to just kind of turn to dust because the music was so loud. And uh, perhaps that was a sort of Abu Ghraib way of like, you know, uh, heavy metalizing, hearing people to torture them into some kind of form of auditory shutdown so that they could, and maybe it was conscious, but I think to understand that my contemporaries who were deaf and partying were as much sort of in this underground kind of scene of, uh, they were they were hipsters, they were had their own networks, they sort of had their own artistic sensibilities, and they were deeply engaged in like what this language that they were particularly engaged, more than Americans are who have a sort of functional literacy, but no real competency in their their language. They they speak. They use this they use this language, English, but they don't really have much as, as a whole, a sensibility of what it's about, what it's doing. And so, so the whole kind of deaf party scene of that time in the early 80s around here, particularly on this campus and around the campus, was, I think, very heady, you know, very uh, investigatory of what, uh, what was going on. It was, and there was sort of like this, this sort of sense of, huge possibilities and change. So you mean people were actively sitting around talking about the language they were using. They were talking about ASL in like a self-reflexive way, talking about here's mm. what I do and what can this language do or when we, you just told that story, Dennis Webster, and that was so cool how you did that shift with the cinematic, you know, I mean people were talking about the language and how you were using it. Yeah, yeah, they were, they, you know, and there's this sort of uh, social, you know, how they sort of like you cop how a person's body language is or you cop their moves. And um, I think like it's, it's like dress, it's like costume too. I mean, people would pick up on how people are doing things in language. And, um, and th that would kind of float off and around is sort of a, this way of being for potentially for somebody else and someone might inhabit that speech costume or that speech code and I think that that was kind of that was more plastic than for hearing people but not particularly because there's just sort of styles of vernacular getting spun off new ways new new la words in a language new ways of saying things that were just kind of typical of probably college age students. Well, there's also the whole thing about that this is when the rubella bulge is happening, these kids who are the first mainstream kids after 94, 142, and 504, which passed in 74 or 73. <clears throat> it was really being done, you know, by the late 70s. People, these kids were mainstream. And a lot of them who heretofore had been from the schools from the deaf are finally coming, are coming in for mainstream programs. and finally getting into this infusion of sign language too. So I wonder if part of it right. is the fact that a lot of and so a lot of the excitement still is kids coming in here and finding a peer group and finding <clears> sign and that they're not the only one and you sign that way and you sign that way and that's wild. Or I've never done ASL in a cue or a well. Or I have a cochlear implant, screw this to take it back. You know? Right, like at each deaf school was kind of like its own slam yeah. center. Uh, it was like every school was a, a poetry slam and so this was like the um, big American slam sort of staging of it all at that point, at that moment. So that, and people were, you know, um, sort of not particular. I mean, not particularly judgmental in a, I mean, maybe aesthetically, but not particularly. I mean, more wanting to get along and um, meet and sort of surprised by like, oh, you know, like uh, you sign Chicago different than I saw in Chicago or, you know, I, and, or, you know, just that variance of, of regional, regional derivations of language. I think people were sort of mesmerized, fascinated by that. And you're right. So there was a certain internal confluence of things going on at that particular moment for that particular generation 
of students that had arrived here sort of in this bulge of uh, early to mid 80s Rochester and that probably brought and then when people like Peter Cook he was one of those people kind of coming into all of that and it, you might have had a sense that someone in that group might have been destined or able to sort of see it all and take it all in and uh, somehow put it back out there in a way that was big enough and new enough that it w was going to blow people's minds. What was happening? So you, you talk about that there were conversations happening, stuff was, uh, that people are acting, actively engaged in exploring it. <coughs> what were the performance things that were happening? Like when you got here and you just became aware of what was happening in terms of, I mean, you're seeking poetry, you're sniffing it out like blue, you know? <laughs> and so where was the inkling that this is what was happening? So I got here in 1982, and uh, I was in a two-year program here. And um, I think the early part of my time during that program was trying to connect with the poetry scene of Rochester itself, which. Um, was its own sort of regional um, offshoot of New York school poets, um, to some degree regional New York state poets, and um, offshoots of beat generation and beginnings of post-beat era poetries. And that was all sort of around Joe Flaherty's Writers and Books Literary Center in Rochester. Um, and at that point, I was meeting people and going to readings there because I had met a lot of poets and studied with a number of them at Naropa, at the Kerouac School. And so I was hungry to, as a young poet at that point to just kind of connect with the poetry scene here. And there were uh, People like Philip Whalen would come through town. Sam Abrams, was uh, the, who taught at RIT English, was here. Um, and um, Ann Waldman would come through. Some of the major poets from downstate New York would come, come up. Because Rochester was a part of both the New York circuit and sort of a national scene. So poets were running through town. And I was meeting my own contemporaries here, too. And then um, as that kind of evolved, and I got to meet the poets who were hearing and steeped in various lineages here in, on, in and around the RIT campus, one day uh, the poet Sam Abrams asked me um, if I had any activities planned for a visit by Allen Ginsberg to Rochester to do reading in the community and also on at the at the uh, college here at the institute here, so um, I thought, well, um, yeah, I might like to try to see if I could set up uh, a meeting with Allen Ginsberg and Robert Panera, the the poet Robert Panera, uh, and they could sort of workshop together. And uh, that might be interesting to the poets and language uh, artists here on campus. Up until that point, on this end of things, um, I had really sort of made myself a disciple or a student of Panera's, and I had kind of gone to him as if he was a certain kind of uh, teacher, but like a spiritual teacher. And I was interested in the lineages of deaf poetry and poetics here that he had 
great knowledge of, and um, I was in awe of of the information that he was giving me. I'd say Patrick Grable as well was, uh, he kind of came later for me, but it was a different kind of s sort of spiritual and aesthetic energy I got from him. But those two ha were playing a big part in sort of my sort of internal development of seeing, um, of learning more about deaf lineages and deaf poetics traditions. And um, I think by the time that uh, Alan and Bob met for this sort of deaf beat summit in February of 84, um, I felt pretty well versed in, in both of those lineages. The beat lineage came uh, out of, you know, a long tradition through Whitman and <clears throat> <laughs> the beat tradition that that I think was so influential to me really comes down to uh, that line from Ginsburg to Whitman um, through Blake and um, so forth but um, I think the deaf tradition that I was uh, seeing through studying with Panera just had turned me on to a, a tradition that, of struggle uh, and of variety that was um, so new to me and of interest. The the problem that I was seeing was um, a lot of issues of trying to emulate as opposed to kind of trying to subjectively do your own thing. And um, the level of experimentation and spontaneity, I'm not sure I'm a person who can judge that in, in, in deaf poetic lineages, but um, the great golden age school that Panera had both scholarly um, championed and participated in at Gallaudet University was, uh, seemed to me when I sort of had a chance to look at the Silent Muse anthology, which was the, probably the most important written uh, text of deaf poetry to that time, and on some level, and not particularly fortunately, may continue to be like the primary text of deaf transmission of poetry in written forms, um, in the sense that that's not particularly vo the, the most vital like aspect of what, happen what has happened and what potentially is most relevant about deaf poetry. Um, that school seemed to be engaging mostly in a closed form kind of poetics of rhymed couplets and um, things so that Panera's poem on his deafness is probably in a, one of the m more exquisite kind of sonnets uh, formations, um, but didn't really convey um, a sense of ASL. I mean, it was, it. he translates it or he performs it as a signed poem as well as a, a poem in spoken English. He does both together, but um, that was not too interesting to me. That's not what was really interesting to me. Occasionally I would see poems by, in written form by, let's say the poet Ed Sollenberger, who was like a a bum, sort of like a classic sort of Buddhist deaf bum in Lower East Side of New York, writing sorts of objectivist poems that were in an open form, that were sort of describing events um, as they were, and that was of interest to me. That was part of what my lineage was about. They were written, <coughs> 
and no. see the no. And But I was interested in also in these people like Ed or uh, Dorothy Miles, um, because they were people who were also, I could see somehow they were struggling with their own personhood and coming to terms uh, with that through poetry, which I think was um, something I could relate to. And I thought that that was something that uh, people would really want, could relate to, the emotionality of it. As Pound says, only emotion endures. So um, the fact that Dorothy Miles was like manic depressive and suicidal, and both she and Solenberger did commit suicide, and wondering sort of what their communities had contributed to their isolation or their um, unhappiness was was really relevant to me too because um, I could see this sort of common ground of um, the heart or I could see this common suffering um, not in the way hearing people as a dominant sort of force like subjugate deaf people to uh, the realm of suffering um, as a way to sort of create the the normate of ability but um, but just everyday common suffering that a person who would meet another person on the street could relate to so I was interested in things like were how communities respond to the poet and ownership that communities take. You know, I'm, I was interested as a, in how Robert Frost would appear at JFK's inauguration and somehow poetry had at that point in early 60s had still this level of um, dynamism that the country could relate to. It emerged uh, uh, this spring, the spring of 2007, when, um, oh, I'm blanking on her name, so it, I, I apologize, but um, um, we had a poet at Virginia Tech, Nikki Giovanni, who uh, was called upon and gave the great eulogy for the m students that were massacred by a Korean student who had massive depression and went postal, like on the students on that campus. And there you had a sort of a relevant um, poetic figure sort of rising as the spokesperson of the people and their suffering and despair and solidarity. So <clears throat> I'm saying that because I think the poets <coughs> in the deaf world that I was learning about really had perhaps greater struggles to just sort of work in the context of language without having to sort of represent the people. And I think the deaf community had and continues to have to try to lay claim to their poets and their, the, the productions of those poets as sort of some kind of um, proof or some kind of uh, like the poet's work is immediately sort of um, absconded by the community as some kind of proof of the, uh, you know, again, the, the capability of this group of people. It's something that um, I don't think, like in the Beat Generation, when in that general context of going against this massive witch hunt and blackballing of people as communist or as uh, deviants or against the state or in, in today's time, you know, under the Patriot Act, um, in a surveillance society that like um, just those basic issues of, of, of going against what people are thinking or, or saying something that the government finds offensive um, or is censorable 
um, I, I didn't see a lot of initiative um, by the, the deaf community to, to take a look at their own sort of need to sort of surveillance or c censor or claim the poetry that was happening. They, and so people had a, a desire to sort of appease I think that was as strong as um, the sense of fun and 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 just experimentation that was starting to come out with people just doing poetry, and they're becoming like a growing body of work. And I think that the work essentially then, in my time, it was kind of clear that ASL was the place where the poetry really was and um, it was great that there was a body of work for hearing people a demonstration to like them that there was real citizenship of deaf people as well but I thought that that again was some kind of proof of humanity that didn't really need to to go on any longer. I, I didn't think that the, anyone had to struggle f to overcome like a sense of pariahood any longer. I just thought that that was a done deal and why don't we just get on to like, let's see the poetry man. So, but we're talking about students who are basically producing mm -hmm. the things that you're seeing. You, you've come from the lineage and you've seen, you've been studying with Panera and you've seen what he's taught you about Dorothy Miles and Bernard Bragg is very much in that mix too. Bob told me you've got to look at Bragg's stuff. He did things like <coughs> nobody else did. Stuff that he talked about in Moss and all. Um, <clears throat> but you get here, and now this meeting takes place, which I, I also want you to talk about a little bit in a second. Also, but um, but all of the theoretical and academic overlays we're putting on it right now didn't exist for these students who are just getting stoned and messing around. Right. So what what were you stumbling onto? What were you like? Did you just go to a party and there were these people who stood up and started doing stuff? And did it look different than storytelling? How did you know that you'd happened upon these kids who were experimenting with some kind of thing that you might think was the poetry you've been sniffing for? Well, the the funny part of that time for me was really I was seeing things one way, and uh, other people were seeing things a different way. So I was seeing what was happening as poetry. Um, a lot of times, even, even, even now, uh, someone will write a poem and want to show it to me. And I'll go, this is terrible. This is like not how you talk at all. This is nothing that has to do with your reality really at all. This is like you talking, like you think a poem should be. And um, in that regard, what I was seeing was really poetry. And the, the circumstance was deaf people did not think of poetry as a deaf thing. So that's the interesting conceptualization that was happening. And what I was involved with was uh, this sense of I'd say, man, that was a poem. And the people would say, Debbie Rennie would say, no, uh, a poem equals English. So I can't, do, I can't possibly be doing that because I have this at best, um, you know, uh, adversarial relationship w with that language. And so I can't possibly be doing poetry I can't possibly be doing, be a poet. I can't possibly have this identity. So I think what I might have been involved with was, a, was on some small level a transmission of um, poetryhood or uh, poet identity um, and really trying to lay sort of a clearer ground to the potential t to just see um, that if people just sat there by themselves or stood b there on a stage by themselves and essentially did their own language 
performance or uh, as William Carlos Williams said, a poem is, is, a, is, is a, like a complex machine. If, they, if what they had created as a piece um, was in and of itself not just a theatrical or a dramatic thing, which deaf people did feel very comfortable with and deaf culture did embrace um, from the silent movie era onward, um, but if in fact that solitary person um, sort of speaking candid, naked, vivid, rememberable mind um, could do, um, then in fact there was the identity that they might be participating in the poetic tradition that goes back to the beginnings of dance and music as well. And so that's what those conversations would essentially be about, was, yeah, I think you're wrong. I think what you're doing is poetry. Did they think what they were doing was storytelling? Or what did the, if there was a label to be had, what is it they got up and said they were going to do? I'm going to show you a blank right now. Watch me. I've been working on this thing, this blank. What do you think? What did they think they were doing? Yeah, I think... You're right. Um, and for some reason, the storytelling tradition for me was separate from poetry. And in and of itself, it is more, uh, it has a greater grandiosity. It's, it's not rock and roll, but it's definitely a higher status than poetry. Um, and I guess I just thought that there was an absence of self, uh, of the sort of, um, it wasn't really allowing people to sort of lay claim to their own mind and their own holiness and their own sanity. It wasn't about them uh, yearning for that. It was in a story and in sort of carrying a story forward, it's in like the Native American tradition, which it was more similar to, I think it was about m moving cultural values like forward through time and cultural memory. And with the essentialness of, a, of a, in a non-written language people, um, that element cannot ever die. And, uh, if it does, the people would die. But Poetry was something else than that as well. And there was something potentially about that mode, that, um, that artistic mode, that would even be of greater value to the people. I mean, in a sort of Shakespearean kind of sense that there was a person that created that stuff and went through the world experiencing something that became something else, but or Dante in a sense of creating a personal cosmic vision and the validity of that among many realities. So the ultimate sense of that for me was uh, in conversations with Peter Cook and when we first met and um, before Alan came to campus and asking Peter if he'd like to go see this thing, and him saying, uh, well, I've been to a poetry reading or two, and that in and of itself was really exciting for me. Um, and, but he would say, you know, he'd look at that scene, he'd see people sitting like we're here sitting now, and, you know, he's, uh, I'm not signing right now, and, um, and I'm talking about deafness. And um, so he's sitting there at a poetry reading, watching some cat on a bar stool with, you know, a piece of paper in his front of his face. And he's talking and or doing his poems. And people are sitting in the audience. 
And it's sort of like, uh, you know, deaf people are sort of like Italians in a certain way. I mean, they're just very gesticular. And Americans are sort of like you sit with your hands in, folded in your lap like I'm doing here, and you're not really, there's no expressiveness. There's nothing sort of, uh, there's nothing coming off the body. There's no stardust. There's, there's just no action coming off. It's just boring. So I think as a deaf person, um, what was fascinating to me was that my initial take from Peter Cook was that this was an exceedingly boring activity, exceedingly pedantic. And so what was kind of exciting was, I mean, I lived, breathed poetry myself. So, uh, and I had just studied with these uh, beat masters, uh, people that appeared in Kerouac's On the Road, I had been studying with Gary Snyder, the ecological poet and Zen master poet. I had studied with Philip Whalen, who was also a Zen master, and I had studied with Anne Walden, and the poetry I was reading was not, was about a way out of this prison mind of the closed poetic forms, where people would say things like, uh, Instead of teaching students about prosody as, as if the form dictated the content of poetry, I would study people like Frank O'Hara, who in his manifesto would say, <clears throat> all you need to know about form is you want to wear your pants tight enough so everybody wants to go to bed with you. And so that was an element that I was walking around thinking about. And in fact, it was sexy what was happening poetically in ASL. It was sexual. It was sensual. It was active. It was, um, it was breaking down conventions. And the argument that then hearing poetry in fact, the, the reverse of what hearing people were trying to impose was that deaf people thought that hearing poetry was just a drag was um, great. It was great because we were involved then in some kind of contest of, uh, of will and a contest of like, uh, well, yeah, I'm going to show you, buddy, you know, watch out. And... Uh, you know, for some reason, uh, Allen Ginsberg had even, uh, I, I think, the sort of uh, mystique or the, uh, the mythos of Howell, the creation of Howell was strong enough that even someone um, who was disinterested in hearing poetry, like a young Peter Cook, um, who was more interested in sort of avenues of theater for the deaf and storytelling and being on the road and experiencing a Kerouac kind of existence in a totally deaf framework. Um, it was something that was of interest to him enough to come. It was something of interest to Patrick Gravel enough to come um, with all his theatric background. These people knew of the hearing world of poetry via Allen Ginsberg, who had somehow sort of uh, come through so many airwaves that it just, uh, nothing could keep him out, it seemed, of pretty much any culture. So those people showed up among students and administrators and, uh, and interpreting students uh, who actually, it was a class for my interpreting uh, studies that I somehow I had arranged that the curriculum for that day would be this one workshop. And uh, they came and uh, hung out. Kip Webster interpreted that session as the main interpreter. I think I introduced um, the two of them, and they sat there, and they dialogued, and um, did some poems. Panera, uh, performed his poem on his deafness. And Alan began talking about <clears throat> how his poem, 
Howell had been translated into many languages, but um, but the key element of it that he was interested in in that moment was how the phrase hydrogen jukebox could be uh, that that was something that had difficulties being translated into other languages, and he was curious how it might be translated <coughs> into ASL. And Panera got up and he sort of did an interpretation of how he thought it might go. And I believe um, Alan said, you know, you're, you made, the, someone explained to Alan that he made the sign of an A-bomb with his hands in the A-shape. So it was like an A-bomb exploding. And the, the idea of a hydrogen jukebox was that the world was uh, insane enough such that like it had created this canned music that even the music was canned inside of some kind of mechanical apparatus like a jukebox. And that essentially, the same way that sort of uh, the lyric formulations of deaf poetry up to that point in the clear, closed forms was like canned hearing music presented to deaf people. Um, and in the more larger context that sort of uh, expression was being canned, mass produced, m mass distributed, and mass consumed, and then sort of this mass sort of uh, capitalist uh, hallucination was just gonna, we're all lost in this matrix of, of uh, just, just the same, just of a homogenous mind. And so we could all just partake of the same hallucination, but in terms of exploring r realities or dharmas um, or gods, um, we weren't gonna have that discussion in this lifetime. So the beats, essentially, I think, in Alan's formulation of the, of the juxtaposed words hydrogen jute box was such that the role of poetry was, in certain times, in their time, was to basically shatter that. And that nuclear, the creation of a whole nuclear world was, in fact, people had produced that themselves and so in the midst of all this canned life we were creating our own destruction and so he felt that Panera had gotten it wrong and asked for other volunteers other people to sort of interpret that and Patrick Grable got up there and did his uh, you know famous where he sort of outlined the shape of the jute box and then sort of like put down the wreck or the wreck he kind of put his arm out to grab a record and then that turned into it coming down and then here came the turntable and then it created the bomb the the sort of the potential of sort of something kind of happening and faster and faster just the sense of like this bomb exploding and it was that ah moment for everybody in the room. I mean, Alan in particular was struck by um, the accuracy of language and uh, the uh, energy of that presentation of thought and uh, was delighted and threw back his head and and laughed. Uh, and uh, everybody in the room laughed too. Um, Patrick Grable, you know, humbly just kind of then took his seat. And I think that that, you know, whatever happened for and aft, that moment was, uh, you know, important. But I, I think that that visual presentation was a huge transmission for everything that would have transpired after that. And so after that workshop, <clears throat> what, what was going on? Like what was Peter, for instance, and his other friends, what were they doing prior to that that was experimental? And then right after it, what came, how did it carry forward and what did they trying afterwards? Well, I can't really speak for Peter per se or any of his pals. Um, they were on the road, they were doing this theater, 
and they were really digging it. They thought that was very cool, and I'm sure it was. The theater, uh, the regular NTID. He, he was doing some kind of theater yeah. troupe. Um, I know I have photographs of, of some notebook of tour that he was involved with at the time. And, um, and of all the folks I met, I, w I was really hanging, I was began hanging out with Peter at that point. Um, we were watching, I'd go to his house, his, his dorm room, or maybe it was, and they had like three televisions. Um, they watched, they watched three TVs at once, and you could see like, and we were watching the presidential debates, and uh, it was funny, you know, like the pictures, w the feeds were all like a little bit off on every channel. And so, like, it was the same thing, but the feeds were off, so everything was sort of delayed between these three um, televisions coming out. And, you know, th I don't know what they thought about that, but I, I just thought that this is how they're doing business over there. This is just how they work. And I just thought it was, uh, okay, you know, I like these people a lot. And... Um, you know, I think we essentially, we would just sort of go back and forth about, hey man, I want you to do this poetry. You know, I'd like you to try this and uh, you're interested and um, I think you, you could do it. And actually he was somehow had got something from this workshop. And, uh, you know, I don't know what he got per se. Um, but he, he essentially, I guess, got a, something to say, I want to try to do this, because I, I think he realized maybe his own real poetic nature and wasn't hung up on the identity of being a, a deaf person. He probably had his own issues with being a hearing child and then having some hearing and, um, and then becoming deaf. So in sort of the worlds of uh, status, I mean, he probably wasn't from a deaf family of nine, 90, you know, generations of deaf people, so he wasn't pure deaf either, so he was an outsider too. And, uh, and oral too. And oral. Yeah, so he had his own outsider issues, um, and maybe he just felt like, I don't know, he just didn't care enough about what uh, you shouldn't be doing in the same way that I really didn't care too much about what I shouldn't be doing as a hearing person. And um, we didn't talk about that per se, but I think we just kind of hit it off as two people. So um, somehow I thought it would be really good to take the energy from that and start a uh, an ASL poetry series, and we used the campus. There was some kind of club-like atmosphere thing. And, we, and Allen Ginsberg had a poem called Bird Brain, which was um, a funny poem, and uh, um, uh, essentially calling the, the government and sort of this sense that we've had all this money and all this potential to do the right thing in foreign domestic policies as a nation, but squandered it every single chance that that occurred. Like we were, we're incapable as a nation of making a wise sort of seven generations kind of decision and bent on just mass destruction, planetary destruction. So, uh, Peter headlined the first Bird Brain Society um, poetry reading and um, series. And then there were several after that, and they were well attended, and um, people liked that. Um, the former clown, uh, mimist, Debbie Rennie, um, she got involved with that too. And so I think that there was uh, a good balance of, of gender energy too that was, um, had, was taking this in that um, I think I can be deaf and be a poet. And, um, and I can use my own language to do that. 
and I can sort of make it up as I go, seeped with the lineages that I've already come to embody and uh, see where that goes um, without really knowing what lies ahead with that. And so those two really stood out. I think maybe Patrick Grable might have read, and I don't know if Panera came down at that point and ever showed up and did something. He, he, stayed, he saw I think he came to yeah. them. But, uh, you know, he was working as a professor here and uh, teaching a huge load and, you know, e educating students uh, to literature. So that was his thing at that point, doing scholarship and literature. And um, at the same time that was happening, there was a club in Rochester called Jazzberries in an old fire station down on Monroe Avenue that was, uh, had given us permission to sort of start a series there as well, poetry series. And so uh, the Rochester uh, poets uh, the circle I had become involved with initially here in town really started um, then being um, a uh, experimental stage for introducing interpreters, sign language interpreters, to a, a hearing audience. And then by doing that, uh, allowing deaf audience members to come and start sort of seeing what was what the hearing poets were doing and not just sitting there reading pieces of paper but understanding what those words were saying and um, so those two things started happening almost simultaneously and there were great sign language interpreters the most dedicated self-dedicated uh, sign language interpreters that were also part of that mix too and as a sign language student I, I so I was involved with those sort of third world folks third mind folks um, even uh, probably the closest and that those were people um, like yourself Miriam and um, Donna Kachitas and Susan Chapel in particular. The three of you were, uh, you know, so deeply involved in translations of hearing text, uh, written text, to ASL for presentation purposes and serious, committed, um, you know, aesthetic-minded people, like, trying to get this right as, as if you would die if you had gotten the wrong word. Um, or he had created the wrong sign, and uh, students of the performance of that, and, um, you know, intense feedback sessions about a performance, like, did I translate this right, and did, um, did this make sense? So, audience, players, interpreters, all this started coming together in this, in this really unusual way that really had never happened anywhere. And I was quite sure that this hadn't happened anywhere. And, um, and I don't think it mattered that it had never happened anywhere um, to th with this velocity. But it was happening, and I saw myself, at least, a part of something that I knew was a golden age moment that Pound had talked to Alan about. And so, essentially, I was seeing a dream of a golden age unfold right before my eyes, and essentially I was just walking through it. And we began bringing in uh, great poets um, Andy Clausen came to Rochester and was interpreted. The New York City poet Bernadette Mayer came up and did a reading that was interpreted. And deaf people were being exposed to like New York school and sort of beat post beat poetics and poetries and just this kind of different personal style that each person would bring to things. And it was, it wasn't done by, um, 
<clears throat> that wasn't then carried over into into ASL <clears throat> by novices who were putting out a, a second and third rate gloss of what was happening, but in, in fact, I think, were putting out these meaningful um, translations and interpretations of, of, of actual form and content and um, expression, um, you know, in the whole body way that ASL is about. And, um, and the deaf end of things was really starting to coalesce into this uh, almost like breakthrough sense of like, wow, yeah, I think, I think it's politically important to me. Um, I think the poets might have been thinking something like this. This is a political act for me to do ASL poetry. Um, it's, and it's both something for my people and it's both something for myself, and in fact, um, this it was a breakthrough moment that ASL equaled poetry, and poetry might equal ASL. And so it allowed people to kind of be free of the academic linguistic discussions of like, is it, it you know, can ASL have poetry, or can't AS, ASL can't have poetry? I mean, these kind of ongoing discussions that certain certain classes of people love to engage in. I think the the most exciting moment in that whole era that happened was sometime then around 84 when um, I said to Kenny Lerner, who was a hearing history major who was out here um, to teach, um, that he should meet this guy named Peter Cook because I somehow think that they would be great friends and not particularly like, uh, and in fact, he, Peter needed someone to sort of uh, work with him to on the end of getting him into the ears of hearing people so that they could get a full understanding of what was happening. So I said you should maybe meet this guy and I said the same thing to Peter Cook and and the two of them met and that was that's sort of a whole other chapter of things. And how did Debbie and Donna end up working together? Did you put them together or were they already friends? Well I was uh, I was uh, befriended by a young brilliant Long Island uh, interpreter Donna Kachitas, who <clears throat> we later married, um, and that became a scene in and of itself for a lot of parties and a lot of poetry parties that would ha after hours kinds of parties that would happen. Um, after readings, and um, so there would be g sort of pseudo deaf, pseudo hearing, pseudo interpreter kinds of bashes after the readings, and I think that we, she had found uh, herself interested in Debbie Rennie and her work, and um, we were all friends, so that like um, Kenny, Peter, Debbie, Donna, yourself, we would start hanging out and uh, goofing around. And I think when Debbie sort of took up the challenge uh, during the Bird Brain Society to get out her poetry, when that translated to downtown Rochester, uh, intercultural uh, poetry readings at Jazzberry's, um, at that series, that was, I ran with Todd Beers, poet in town. Um, <clears throat> she needed somebody to be her voice as well. And I, she chose Donna Kachitas, who was uh, exceedingly gifted um, poetic interpreter. 
and they sort of bonded in the same way that Kenny Lerner and Peter Cook bonded. So you had sort of uh, a, this cross-gender, so you had it happening through the feminine and the masculine. You just had this, these, this wasn't just a male thing happening, and it wasn't just a femme thing happening. It was happening uh, regardless of gender. So it was happening, and sort of there was a full-blown diversity kind of thing going on that poetry couldn't encapsulate. And around then also there were these improv times with Stefa, right? She had, these work, she had a loft or a studio somewhere, and it seemed like the dance stuff was incorporating sign, or the sign was incorporating dance, something like that. I don't know if you know. If I don't know, know much about that. that. Okay. <clears throat> There's some elements of that in there I have to explore. You know, okay. That the dance stuff influenced Debbie a lot and hit Patrick that Debbie had the dancer like quality to her movement and wondered if maybe that was why Sullivan and that way. Um, how long did Birth Brain, Birth Brain go? Not too long. Maybe like, I think till the end of the school year, uh, probably to the end of spring 85. If maybe to, the, yeah, it went, uh, or maybe to the spring of 84 after Ginsburg had come. We did a th few sessions and they ran out at 84. That's definitely the spring of 84 because I graduated from the interpreter training program here in 84 and then went on to become a deaf educator, quote unquote. Uh, through my studies at the University of Rochester, and I don't think I continued that. <coughs> That's when I began thinking about what had happened. I mean, so by 85, um, I was already thinking about what had happened, which means what had essentially happened, which, what, which would be... Um, this cross-cultural exchange and this um, sort of transmission of beat energy and beat traditions, which in, in and of themselves are not about the poet per se, but what the poet, what traditions the poet is carrying forward in a new way. Um, that transmission had happened. And so you had the early sort of poetic careers of um, Peter Cook and Kenny Lerner, Donica Cheetahs and Debbie Rennie, and myself is sort of the odd man out in all ways you could imagine, like forming a little troupe uh, called Bridge Of. And I think that was a very short-lived um, performance troupe. We performed at the Hudson Clearwater Revival, and we did another show in Vermont, I think at the University of Vermont, and. Burlington. And I think after that it was kind of clear that Kenny and Peter were doing a thing that would soon morph into the Flying Words Project, and that was their vehicle. And uh, Debbie and Donna's thing would be somewhat occasional, and um, but not as lasting, and not really as um, it didn't it produce as much work it, for the parties involved. So um, I don't know what that was about um, in terms of longevity, but the work that they created was the work that they created, and it was, uh, it's in a body of work. Well, and at this time, too, is when you decide. 87 is when the first National Death and you had contacted me uh, in the winter time. My mom had died. I was living in New Mexico with my dad, taking care of him. And you had called me and said, I'm thinking of doing this thing in the fall. You want to help me do it? You want to help me coordinate? Will you interpret for it? Will you help me coordinate interpreting service? Whatever. And I said, sure. It sounds great. And so and that started really rolling in the late spring and all summer we were planning. So what made you want to do that, and how did you pick you know, the, the local players we know about, but 
Clayton and Ella were involved in that too. So what was your knowledge of them? How did you get all that together? Well, um, I think when I was in in grad school, um, I was I continued my interest in deaf poetics, so deaf history. So I had come across Clayton Valley's work and Ella Mae Lentz's work, and um, I was interested in what they were doing. I was interested in Valley's um, commitment to ASL from a totally different. Um, you know, history than we were, the, the, what had happened here at Rochester, which was pretty much like a, a beat kind of thing. And uh, Ella Lentz was just someone, you know, you'd actually see her pictures in uh, your ASL books, you know, like it would be like her face in there when you're learning a sign. It would be like Ella's, Ella presenting the sign for like, you know, whatever, you know. You know, cooking or something, and it's like this woman is a radical, you know, uh, poet um, on the West Coast, and so Valley's, you know, a uh, hardcore, committed, sensitive, a gay, you know, uh, poet uh, on on the East Coast. So it was sort of this sense of like, okay, it, I wonder if there's a potential to pull together a national kind of sensibility of a poetry conference for the deaf. But a little before that, while I was in uh, stud doing my studies, I had written a paper for uh, that explored what would, had happened in Rochester from this Deaf Beat Summit in 84. And, um, you know, in the past, I've had a poet friend, Randy Rourke, who I'm very close to all these years from my student days with him at Naropa. Um, Randy was, uh, had, tra had sort of, was left to type up all this conversation that Allen Ginsberg had had in all his classes at Naropa, and that amounted to over 28,000 pages of discourse that would have uh, gone into, um, that I don't think has really been published yet, but when I look at pieces, of posthumous pieces of Allen's like Deliberate Mind that have come out, and um, it's, that's the kind of thing where he had a student actually then type up these talked on the tongue tapes. Um, <clears throat> but so I had written Alan to be his apprentice, and it took a certain kind of audacity to do that, and saying, like, I think you should have me as an apprentice. And Randy always hounds me to this day that that took a lot of balls, you know, like to, to sort of think that you were like somebody that should, uh, you know, that somebody should think that there's somebody about. And uh, <coughs> so I'd written this paper, of which I think I received a B um, from my uh, teachers, and uh, I sub you know worked on it more, maybe six months, and um, it was, I think it was called The New Visible Poetics or something, and I had sent that to William Stokey, who was still alive and doing sign language studies out of Gallaudet. And um, I heard back from him in uh, a little over a week that he would be glad to accept this paper. And uh, he thought it was terrific. And he wanted people to know about this. And that little paper would have influenced, you know, people like Dirksen Bauman and uh, the more heavy hitter academic uh, poetics uh, professors um, in the academies, you know, teaching poetry. So <clears throat> before we get to a national poetry conference, there seemed to be a need to kind of rise things up through as many channels as possible in terms of credibility. 
And that little seminal piece was a part of that that probably gave me the ego to proclaim again as a hearing person um, something I was seeing in a culture that was really um, has a difficult time with hearing people's trying to lay claim to any kind of sense of what is and isn't going to happen for them um, a basis but it was what I saw and it was sort of my own thing and um, it it sort of caused something to happen I'm not sure what but I do think it caused something to happen later in terms of deaf studies and um, So somehow we got the bread. Um, we had a really wonderful, wonderful administrative person at NTID around that time, Adele Friedman. And um, she somehow was very, um, she was sort of like a Victorian mind woman. She might have been like a friend of Mary Shelley's or something. She might have like, um, seen Frankenstein when it was being, you know, hatched or something like that, or when, you know, when Shelley was out of town or, uh, you know, in his rowboat, like rowing to Italy or somewhere with Byron, and she was at home, you know, like, um, you know, taking speed and Valium and like writing Frankenstein or something. Someone like Adele Friedman might have been like her friend or something, I, I don't know. and. <clears throat> she understood in, just intuitively that this was really important and sort of brokered the deal that would allow uh, us to try and sort of pull off a national poetry conference here, which, had, which was a place essentially that had very little interest as a technical institute in poetry at all, which on the other hand, and it's a very corporate looking environment, and on the other hand, it's kind of filled with art students, people who are really um, are very creative young people. So <clears throat> the, the lineup was Patrick Grable, Ella Mae Lentz, and Clayton Valley. So they sort of represented sort of a, an established ASL um, first school of the modern era and this era is like late 20th century and then there was the introduction of what had happened here which was essentially the the beginning of a experimental um, uh, I would say spontaneous um, kind of Kerouac um, Ginsburg, Waldman kind of sense of deaf poetics in, embodied by Debbie Rennie and Peter Cook with their own traditions, vast traditions of theater, dance, clown, mime, sort of uh, lineages that they embodied as well. And in conjunction with hearing interpreters that were bringing um, an additional uh, quality to them. In Debbie's case, it was, I think, she was producing the work herself, and she was using Donna Kachitis more as an interpreter. But in the radical formation of Peter Cook with Kenny Lerner, and the, you know, the sort of tension that that created on the community itself that and the and the sort of the misunderstand the potentials for misunderstanding that, that was really a collaboration of work being created by a hearing and deaf person uh, with a deaf face and uh, a hearing kind of radical mind um, so Peter Cook essentially was the headliner in my mind, and I arranged the conference so that he was the headliner. He was the last, and um, and we had panels, and we had readings, 
and uh, there was just a lot of get together stuff going on, and it was just uh, and we documented it, and <clears throat> I think that was an essential element I had gained from Naropa, which now has its own audio archives, which is so vast, and uh, and then coming to NTID, that was something they could do, and so that was very good because we had really high quality um, documentation tools at our disposal and they were interpreted fully interpreted and so they were uh, strongly attended and uh, the people that met each other I think were um, bonded uh, there was sort of this sense of uh, high level, best minds, uh, poets coming together um, at both ends of a generation um, or several generations. But there was that sense of best minds of a generation kind of coming together and um, presenting their work um, with great dignity and um, difference. Did you feel that you caught any flack for, you, you mentioned very briefly about being a hearing person involved in this and the sensitivity that you had to have to the fact that, that people so often feel that their things are co-opted and whatever. Did any of that spill over during the conference or was it, uh, was it overtly dealt with? I know that Kenny had to deal with a lot of the, you know, or, and Peter had to deal with having Kenny as his partner, you know, <coughs> you shouldn't have a hearing person involved in this, this is deaf stuff sacred territory, what are you doing here, kind of thing, and slog through that. Yeah, I think Kenny Lerner took on the bulk of um, disparagement and uh, and discrediting. There was a, there wasn't meant, you know, I think, um, in any kind of truly malicious way it was just meant it just happened in the same sense he was cast into the role of uh, like uh, 65 Newport Dylan plugging in and he just sort of had to face um, that and essentially I think he d didn't care and um, it wasn't his deal um, essentially that was other people's problems about and the thing was people could would keep coming back they actually liked what was happening so much and at the same time it's one of those great moments where in in true art lasting art where you're disagreeing with it every step of the way that you're falling in love with it and so um, as their work started then really being exposed to the deaf community in a national way. And it's, it is very, um, I don't know how difficult it is now, but if you want to start banging the drums of the deaf grapevine, um, you, that message gets out there pretty fast. And I think that people were confused in essence by what Peter was putting out in terms of a poem and how he was using ASL as poetry and uh, because in a way he was putting it out such that he understood what it was about but he wasn't but he but they didn't so there was a question of like well this poem isn't like absolutely making sense to me but that didn't mean that every line wasn't brilliant or every phrase of picture making wasn't just the most m taken from most memorable scenes of life so that their impact was in fact great but he was doing poetry in this in the contemporary sense that like uh, he was making the sense of his own mind and he was making that he was laying that out as his gift for people 
and he was also laying on a gift that wasn't his own mind uh, or even necessarily his own uh, he didn't necessarily even necessarily agree with it um, because he hadn't particularly written um, the entire thing that he was doing he was just pulling off um, the he was the conveyor of the bomb that sort of the bomber had made on on some level and the and but Peter's sense of as the bomb carrier wasn't like was really the sense that we'd wish for poetry communities around the world insofar as uh, poetry bombs instead of suicide bombs I mean they were like uh, they were anti-suicide bombers and uh, essentially they were spreading then this sort of radical message of mind that just would fill people with imagination and the potential to tell a story that wasn't so literal or be stuck to a story that was wasn't so start to finish narrative and uh, in fact was a story more um, like cut and pasted or uh, in a Burroughs tradition of uh, or in a sampled kind of manner or in a cinematic manner where you're like looking at technique of views and angles and exits and entrances and um, taking that whole history and totally just turning it upside down and inside out and they were doing all that people thought it was incredible and it was nothing that they had ever seen before and regardless of other deaf media figures at the time um, whether it, because even someone like Bernard Bragg who was probably the most well-known deaf media figure uh, actor um, they weren't really doing their own thing and their own thing was probably not a thing that was sort of bent by uh, uh, introduction of sort of shall we say alternate consciousness and there was an alternate consciousness universe being created here and I think that that was the thing that people wanted to go into and in a fearless manner so I think the a community of people were at once totally angered by the introduction of an alternate universe you know, parallel universes, parallel cosmoses into their own heads by these by this one guy with a hidden hearing person. And I think that Kenny took a lot of that on. But essentially the work is all that matters. And the work that was being done was visionary in a new sense and also coupled to great visionary work of the past even without necessarily being literate in a in a very conscious or studious manner towards it so I think Kenny took the heat um, I recall him him sort of like you know shaking his head like you know why me uh, he was sort of the person that was crucified um, and my crucifixion came later um, and that's that was uh, at a, another conference yeah yeah I'm not sure we're gonna go there today further than that time than this time that's today. good because I think um, I mean it's not really a crucifixion either well in a sense I see it that way too I see it that way but I think that for the purposes of Good. I think I'm going to keep it on poetry and Good. Not, even, not even go into that, even those other conferences okay. at all. Yeah. You know, it might change my mind about that later, which I guess I'll fly back. I hope you don't. <laughs> I, I, don't think it, I don't think we need to. 
page for this story. Um, I'm really worried about time. For yeah. Girl. Okay. So, let me just see if there's anything that I absolutely have to have. Pretty much got everything. I, I think the one thing that I'd really like you to address if you could is there a way that you can describe why the stuff that Debbie and Peter was doing, why is it beat? It's hard to put a definition on what beat poetry is, or why is Gallen Ginsberg was beat? Why are these beat, why were these deaf poets considered beat? Why is, do you see it as a transference that this was deaf beat poetry? So maybe, I don't mean to be simplistic, but is there a way that you could say, you know, why was, why was beat poetry at all different from the things that came before it, and why would you, if, if you could say why this would be called beat poetry in the deaf Well, I just think that the beat generation was a marketing, it was marketing lingo. Um, and it was a way to define a group of people for marketing purposes. So, um, you know, there's no real beat generation per se. There's, there's no generations per se. I, I do think that, um, <clears throat> And in retrospect, I don't think I was wrong in sort of like characterizing this as a deaf beat summit. Um, I do think that the Allen Ginsberg in particular was focused on compassion and he was focused on mainlining, the poet's job was to mainline into mass suffering. So, um, <clears throat> You had to have a see. You had to sort of access your own secret mind to get there, and so you had to disclose. And I mean, you know, on some level, people are we're all hung up on disclosure, particularly in the kind of society where, you know, they have cameras stuck to our eyeballs looking at us, and they know where we've been, or they know what we bought, they know. So, but, uh, you know, in the realm of disability or in the realm of, you know, that uh, unfield field of deafness that's not di disability and not necessarily ability, but in fact is, is really its own aspect of, of life. It sort of plays, it sort of plays the fence. It plays it both ways. And, uh, I mean, when the time comes to, to not be, uh, have that sort of uh, coalition, you know. Um, it can be, it'll go either way. Um, as a people. But at that point, and now, I I can't say for sure, but I've kind of like lost my train of thought. <laughs> well, I was asking about like why the why Peter and Debbie would be considered why you would think they were deaf beat poet. Like why is their poetry mm -hmm. different from Ella Clayton and Panera? Mm -hmm. it, it obviously is when you look at it. Mm -hmm. Just as Allen Ginsberg is different than Emily Dickinson. And Emily Dickinson had just as much compassion and self-disclosure, and you know, right. the whole thing was all about. So I'm not really sure that, that the self-disclosure part, I mean, poets all through the ages, it's the, the, the impetus for their art and their self is, is all about self-disclosure and all about that sort of angst and belschmerz and all that kind of thing. Right. So where, so is it, a, is it form? It seems that there's a great deal of it that has to do with form. Panera talked about that in our interview or during the workshop about mm -hmm. free verse and how freeing it was to be able to not have to worry about so so the the, the, the lack of form in a sense or the playing of form or is there any way you can address that? I don't think that form ruled um, for for Peter Cook or, or Debbie Rennie. Um, and that's not to say that their works aren't exceedingly formal. 
um, the formal elements are probably what we see, and those elements are the things that probably are the are the things that are affecting us most on some level. But I think it's the vision that they bring to the poem. I think it is a level of disclosure and that they bring to the poem. I do think that they brought a secret mind to the poem and let it out there. And I, I, everything from, you know, everything from Peter Cook's doing his oral presentation of I was ordered not to talk to, which is an ultimate kind of secret mind disclosure, which carries a lot of emotion and a lot of integrity with it, to his sort of more surreal, and, and I guess it was the surrealism that they brought to their poetry, um, so that they really were not hung up on the representational. They weren't presenting poems in a classic sort of uh, storytelling or in an in American letters way, objectivist way of sort of like obituary kind of like writing. Like, you know, Aunt Rose um, had four children and she died. And she's buried here. Um, but they, are, or the snow came down and it was beautiful. I, um, but there was a surreal sense of, um, almost in the sense of like someone like Robert Desnos, the French poet, or uh, the sense of, um, there's something really international about what was, ha what they were, what their vocabulary was. And, um, and their vocabulary exhibited a certain kind of surreal sense of time and space and life that I think is part of this alternate consciousness that um, the beat generation turns out being sort of about in a sense of an on the road culture that's it's part of that street language that is uh, you know, sees like Time Magazine as official U.S. sort of doctrine on what is happening in the world this week. But I think later, as time went on, uh, and for myself and my connection with these f poets, is that, you know, we're not beat generation poets. So we were something else. And um, our time is not been defined and we don't have scholars and critics studying us with uh, necessarily as much uh, certainty because the media isn't telling the world that with any kind of certainty that this is even happening let alone that this is good so I consider the surrealistic qualities, um, the um, adventures in form, the, um, the what is being brought sort of the, to the marketplace of ideas is in their poems, um, such as Deja Vu Salesman, um, which was always a, f I remember being so knocked out when I saw that like, I can't believe this is happening. I can't, I can't believe that this is being formulated. So it's, it's, I was never in a sense that this isn't <clears throat> happening to me through form. But I was taking in something personally that was uh, like beyond language. Um, it was sort of in the meta language levels that uh, you could go to in like, uh, um, Spall and Gray swimming to Cambodia, or you kind of go into when you're reading a poem where you're just, uh, your world and the, the world that you're reading about or he watching is sort of creating this whole other movie in your mind while it's going on that is even, it's a collective consciousness uh, 
that you've entered into. So this p person has opened doors to sort of a, a higher consciousness and <clears throat> and it was happening after the beats. So my affinity with the deaf poets of my lifetime now is that we're part of a post-beat era, which, you know, is defined by different parameters um, and, and greater complexities and more instant communication and um, encyclopedic styles from which to choose from, almost an over overplay of potential styles. I mean, you can have Italian, you can rip off passages of anything from the internet and put it into your poem, or you can do, uh, you can sort of rip off any visual that you see and put it into your poem. I mean, just the explosion of the visual or textual worlds that we're living in defines us differently than, than that era that we came from. But I think that there's a great affinity for what I saw in the disregard for official versions of the way the world is from those two poets that the others did not receive or <clears throat> they walked with a more militant or a more uh, they were in a more ambiguous time of being alone trying to work out for themselves a sense of what was right for them um, and by the time it, it, it sort of was the difference between Perry Como and the Beatles um, it, w it just was like that much <clears throat> of a cultural explosion as a, as a difference and where there was a certain tranquility that I think Clayton Valley was after, after um, a need for serenity. And I think Ella Lentz is, was engaged in a certain kind of militancy. And Patrick Grable was invested with a certain kind of pathos or ethos a certain kind of uh, soulfulness that, uh, and skilled with, uh, as we've talked about, uh, a, 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 re a whole uh, other Patrick Grable sense of being able to actually uh, sort of rip off his clothes and then there was this whole other being, in fact, there, but sort of restrained, fighting against restraint, his own restraint. <clears throat> I think there was an element of restraint that people were still shackled by um, that somehow this collection of hearing and deaf and men and women and gay and straight and uh, deaf and hard of hearing and postlingual and, you know, prelingual and uh, and the various beat traditions that <clears throat> had been brought forward that, t that the poets who were hearing were embodying in their own separate kind of channels and carrying forward. I just think that that brings with it uh, this whole s other sense of like, you know, the sky's the limit. Uh, we're just gonna tear this hotel room up and then we're going to go down and do the show and then we're going to come back and you know and we're going to like look at what we did and talk about it all night long and then we're going to keep talking about it and we're not going to stop talking about it and why it was so interesting to talk about <clears throat> I just think it was and why it was Rochester I just think it was it just happened for its own reasons, which isn't an answer, but um, I just think the mix of things was right, the same way the mix of things was right in the Paris Hotel, you know, 
um, for the Beats when they were in exile. So we were all sort of in exile from uh, something, I would think, and looking for uh, a way to just be ourselves as poets in a society that wasn't and it actually grows sort of less interested in truly what the power of the personal in poetic expression. So it's the hydrogen you Yeah. <laughs> blew it up. <laughs> That's it. Okay. That's great. All right. That's great. All right. That's really good. Oh. Uh, yeah? Isn't awesome. it awesome? Mm-hmm. Isn't it awesome? What? How are we gonna even figure out which parts? You know, uh, it's awesome. Um, one thing I wanted to tell <coughs> you, I just didn't want to take the time with it. One of the things Patrick said was that when he watched the sampler DVD I gave him, he was very struck by the fact of how um, he and Ella and Panera and Clayton were just standing still, camera on them, face forward, and that Debbie and Peter moved. And he said, so he realized that he could move. And so he decided to try a couple of things later where he moved. <laughs> said it was so free. He didn't know he could move. I mean, there were just things that were so embedded in performance, uh, art, and song. Wish, wish we talked about it. So it was just like being at a hearing poetry reading? In a sense, well, I wouldn't say that it was, <coughs> it's still visually very interesting to watch Patrick Graydon. Right, you know, but sound. there was still. But there was this rooted to the spot, very formalistic. Like Anglican, like you were in church. Right, and I have him saying that, you know, uh-huh. that it's very, you know, that he felt, you know, that wow, And the other thing I was thinking of was that when you're talking about all the images... Kenny is not going to say I left out probably the best parts of, of all this. I'm really disappointed that it was, wasn't last night, but... Oh, 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 well, tell me, we can revisit that. Well, I don't know what it is, you know, oh. like... <laughs> the other thing I was thinking with all the... You were talking about the images and all the things with poetry you could do now and all the media and all the things you could do, and it's, it's like wiki poetry, you know. Mm-hmm. Grab, 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 grab. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I probably should have used that well, example. Anyway, this is this is just great. And the other thing was like when you were talking about deaf people and their own sort of set they're sometimes it works both ways. They work both sides of the fence. It could be like that, but mm-hmm. it's not even a disability, it's like its own separate thing. I thought it's like Texas. <laughs> <laughs> if I, I should have said it that it came to me that the deaf death is like it's Texas. like Texas. <laughs> <laughs>